Well, it's a little after three o'clock, so we will uh, go ahead and uh, get started. So, welcome to this week's Dear Spatial Forum. Uh, I think many of you uh, know who I am, but in case you don't, uh, I am Dr. Artoni. I am Associate Director of Educational Innovation uh, here in the Center for Dear Spatial Analytics. And I also serve as the Director of our uh, Professional Master's Program as well as our uh, Graduate Certificate Program. Uh, so today we have a little bit of a different format uh, for our forum. Uh, as you can see, we have uh, some panelists here. Um, all of them are alumni from representing all of our different graduate programs. We also have a um, couple of alumni on uh, virtual. Uh, and so we will get to introductions in a few minutes. Uh, but I did want to kind of keep a few things off um, in terms of just broadly talking about um, our overall alumni uh, from the center and kind of where we where we stand in terms of where are the alumni now and um, yeah how many there are and all that good stuff. So so we did reach a, a nice um, milestone uh, in fall of 2023. Um, as of December 2023, with those graduates, we surpassed a thousand alumni from the center. Um, so for those of you that are students of the center, uh, you're, you'll be in good company. Um, 620 of those are from our graduate certificate program in GIS. Uh, 365 of those are from our professional master's degree. And obviously those programs have been around a lot longer than the PhD program, but even with the PhD having, you know, entering its fifth year, I think, um, that we are already at 17 alumni from the PhD program as well. And so um, what are these alumni doing as a whole? So what I did, um, many of you know we have a, a LinkedIn networking group, and if you did not know that we have that, then I will, I will send all the students a link um, after this uh, forum. Uh, but it's a private group. It's only open to current students and alumni of our programs, and so it's a great place to see what other people are doing, um, seek jobs. Um, we have many former students that will post jobs to that group and things like that. But it's also a great source of data. And so uh, what I did was I just went out to our Arlington networking group and it has some analytics that you can pull in terms of job titles, uh, industry profiles of where our alumni are. And so, go ahead and next one. So these are the sort of broad industry profiles um, for uh, the folks that are part of that group, right? So obviously this is a subset of our 1,000 plus alumni, uh, but we do have 436 uh, students in that group. Um, again, it is also a mix of some current students as well as alumni. So again, the data is a little bit skewed um, and it's probably also skewed towards our master's and certificate just because they've been around longer and more of those students are part of that, that LinkedIn group. Um, but I think it's still, Holds, and I think it is actually a kind of a good sort of um, way to see how what the distribution is like in terms of sort of just broad industry categories. Again, within each category, it can mean a lot of different things, right? Um, but I think one thing to point out is, you know, IT services is a big chunk of that. Um, a lot of what we do in geospatial is, is IT. Um, and so I think that, that makes sense. Environmental services, uh, research services, um, government administration, and those kind of things. Um, for those of you online uh, that are in the audience, if other than Kellen and Peter, if you would uh, drop your video for us, that'd be great. Um, okay, uh, higher ed, um, defense, space manufacturing. I'm not sure what space manufacturing is, but sounds cool. Um, business consulting and services, utility, civil engineering, software development. Um, I think you can see sort of natural bits of, of the things that we do across the geospatial. And then of course there's a big chunk that is other, right? So those are maybe individual alumni or students that are they're doing something in different sectors. Um, but this is really just to show you that there's a, a diverse sort of grouping of industries that the alumni there, at least in the LinkedIn group, um, represent. So what are their job types? Um, obviously the biggest chunk here is other. Um, and I think that just speaks to the fact that there's no real single job title out there that encompasses geospatial, right? And I think that was brought home um, by Anthony Calamito uh, during his presentation a couple uh, forums ago. Um, and just the fact that, you know, all kinds of positions are geospatial, but they may not be called GIS something, or they may not be called geospatial something. Um, and I think that's captured in this sort of other uh, bucket. 
but there are still plenty of you know GIS analysts, GIS specialists, technicians, GIS developers, uh, research assistants, project managers, software engineers. So again, I think you can see the parallels between sort of these groupings of job titles and the uh, sort of broad industry profiles um, in the previous pie chart. Again, from the same LinkedIn group, same kind of subset of, of students um, in that. Um, but yeah, so that gets me to, uh, I just wanted to kind of talk broadly, first of all, about all of our alumni, what they're doing and um, how they're doing. Um, but we got some, some uh, specific alumni to join us today, again, representing um, all three of our programs, um, our certificate, uh, our master's program, as well as our PhD program. And so um, the way this is going to work is I'll kind of serve as a general moderator for the panel. Um, I'll have them introduce themselves, obviously, first, so you just know who they are. Um, you can switch to the next. Um, and many of you got this in the, in the announcement as well, in terms of who our, our alumni speakers are going to be. But um, I do have some sort of questions that some people submitted ahead of time to kind of help us help the flow keep going in case all of you are shy and don't want to ask questions. Um, but I'm hoping that's not the case and that our audience both online and here um, in person will, will seek out and ask questions of our alumni. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of um, interesting things you'd like to ask um, about um, each of their sort of trajectories and, and their skill sets. And so, um, for those of you online, uh, when we get to sort of the Q&A uh, portion um, of the panel, um, if you'll use the raise your hand feature, that way we'll see that you have um, raised your hand and we'll call on you and we'll ask you to actually um, speak your question and not type it in the chat. Um, and then also for the panelists as well that are online, so Callan and Peter, um, if there's a specific question directed to you or if it's direct the entire panel and you, you have a response, you want to uh, speak as part of that uh, response, uh, just raise your hand as well. That way we'll know you want, there's something you want to uh, contribute uh, to that discussion. But otherwise, um, what we'll do now is have each of our panelists uh, just kind of go through, introduce themselves, uh, let you know who they are and sort of where they've uh, come from and where they are now. And then we will just open it up for the Q&A for the rest of the time. So let's start with our online uh, panelists. And uh, Peter, uh, we can start with you. Hello, everyone. My name is Peter Erlenbach. I'm a solution engineer with Esri. I graduated from North Carolina State. Oh, buddy. Seems like a while ago, but 2022, I believe. So since then, I joined Esri as a solution engineer, specifically within our global business development division, serving state and local government. Kellen? Hey, everyone. I'm Kellen Montgomery. Um, I'm a geospatial modeler on the phytosanitary advanced analytics team uh, with the USDA APHIS plant protection quarantine. And I can tell you more about what that is. It's a lot of acronyms. Um, but I am a remote worker. I work out of Roanoke, Virginia. Um, and we have a small team of, of about eight people working on various analytics projects for uh, to support decision making. Um, and I graduated from the PhD program in 2021. I was actually part of the, the very first cohort. So we were the guinea pigs. Glad to be here. Yeah, hi, I'm Al Cardinal. I graduated in the summer of 2020 with my master's in geology and the grad cert. Um, and having that graduate certificate was a big reason why I got hired at the height of the pandemic. Um, and I'm with AECOM, I've been there four years now. Uh, it's a really large environmental engineering consulting firm, it's like 50,000 employees. Um, and the bulk of my work focuses on water, storm water, drinking water, groundwater. Um, clients are predominantly Department of Defense, um, which is maybe always a sensitive thing. Um, but I sometimes support uh, state programs, MCDOT and DUQ as well. I'm Brett Cox. I am currently the research manager for the Carolinas for JLL, which is a commercial real estate firm. And uh, I got into this line of work uh, from a varied background. I actually went to undergrad at UNC Chapel Hill. Go ahead and boo. Uh, <laughs> as a music major, all things. 
Yeah, and I was a I was a teacher, and I figured out that that wasn't going to be a long term solution for my life and my career. Um, I actually sat down with Dr. Money, and I don't know if he remembers this. I booked an appointment. And I said, I'm trying to change careers. And he said, let's take it one class at a time uh, because I had no background in any kind of technical uh, field at all. And uh, took one class, then they let me into the CERT program. I finished that in 2017. Then I got into the master's uh, program, finished that in 2020. And uh, the very professional experience has continued since then. Worked at a software uh, company uh, in ag tech. Uh, went out and did my own thing uh, for about a year. Uh, was a stay-at-home dad for a little less than a year, and then now jail also. Then here, there, and everywhere. Uh, I'm Vinny. I am second class of PhD student uh, here. I graduated in 2022. It's been a long time ago, and uh, it's been great. Uh, been at Planet for, if you sum up the, the time with my internship there, almost two years now. Uh, I'm a software engineer with the base maps team, and I, yes, even though I've, I'm a software engineer, I don't have a computer computer science background. I have a background in agriculture, environmental science, and then a PhD in geospatial analytics, and now I'm a software engineer. So. Yes, uh, it's been fun, and it's great to be here with you. Great. All right. So um, I'll, I'll kick things off. So as you know from the forums, we always ask all of our speakers three broad questions for them to uh, answer. And so we're going to do the same with our panelists. But we'll just start with, with one of those questions, and we'll get to the other two um, later on. But so the first question that we always ask um, any speaker that comes to the forum is, how has your career trajectory led you to using a geospatial perspective? So if anyone wants to, to chime in or I can kind of call you one by one, but. All right, we'll go one by one. Let's start with, uh, <laughs> let's start back with Peter. <laughs> I, know I figured if that. I was quiet, you'd come back to me. Um, so just to repeat the question is how has our career trajectory led us to consider a geospatial perspective? Is that right? You got it. I think for me, I so I went to college or undergrad at least at Virginia Tech through 2018, and I was initially going to be an engineer. I believe I was yeah I was going to be a civil engineer, but when I was in a exploring engineering course, I got exposed very briefly to GIS. Went home that following summer and just dove headfirst into it. So I've to answer your question. I started looking at GIS in college and, and went from there, but. Over the years, GIS has changed very drastically. So I always had a very strong inclination towards computers, environmental conservation, and just our general environment. So being able to manage that, analyze it, and share that information out was always something that piqued my interest. So that's kind of how I, what led me to choosing a geospatial perspective on my career, specifically within GIS. Okay. All right, Kellen, you're next. <laughs> Actually, my answer is really similar to Peter's. Um, I was uh, at Virginia Tech as well. And um, yeah, go Hokies. And um, <clears throat> I think I was more interested in anthropology, the cultural side, uh, and geography was the closest thing that Virginia Tech offered to that. Um, but I also was always very interested in just the, the interaction between different systems, like human systems and natural systems. Um, and so geography was just fascinating and the perfect domain to study that. Um, and then similarly, GIS was the way to get a job, basically, you know, in the, the really marketable part of that. Um, and I was um, just had kind of a, a talent for the computer science side. So it just fit for me and it was a great way to just blend all of my interests, um, cultural, you know, systems, how they all work together, environmental issues, agriculture, you could do it all um, using a geospatial approach. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, similarly, like I think my education kind of shaped my approach instead of the other way around. I mean, geology is a very spatial like area. Um, uh, as is JS. And I think 
sort of like what Kellen was saying, I chose it one for an interest, but also because it's extremely marketable and having those skills are really, really important. And also it brings together a lot of stuff. I work with a lot of engineers um, and some chemists and remediation specialists and other things, but it, it really allowed me to bring some tools and bring together so many different like fields of interest. Uh, you know, you kind of heard my background a little bit. Um, mine's mine, how I was led here is a little bit different. Come home, I'm uh, a little bit turned off from my career, and uh, uh talking to my wife, I'm saying I, I gotta do something different. She said, Hey, I work with these people, it's kind of something called GIS, <laughs> you know. I mean, I think it would be something that you're good. I want to go back to school. I don't want to go back and, and do um, a bachelor's degree all over again. You know, I want to progress uh, in my education and not restart. Uh, so uh, I find the uh, NC State that might say that's cool. Look at a video on YouTube from Penn State. Basically, going over you know, what is what is it like to think spatially, and then what is what is uh, GIS essentially. And uh, I remember sitting there where where my computer is. I'm like, this this is how it will be think. And it's like we don't think in Excel sheets, and like normal people think about where things are. Um, why aren't we, why isn't this part of normal everyday life more? And, um, and I was sold on it. And so that's how I decided to go down that route. And that's kind of the philosophy that I've had with it as I've gone through my career now is trying to answer people's questions from a geospatial perspective, even whenever they're not really GIS people. Right, because they'll come to me, and I was talking to a couple of people beforehand, uh, working in real estate now. But look, you know the the phrase is location, location, location. But uh, the the systems that uh, I walked into on day one, and everyone's just working in Excel sheets. And I'm like, that doesn't that doesn't tell you anything. Uh, I mean, it tells you numbers words but where's the story it's if it's about location then let's make it location based and so you know it, it just taking this the way that we actually think which is spatially uh that's how we live our life and then applying that to problems like practical problems that everyone deals with in business or everyday life uh, that's that's kind of how i'm approaching it since uh, i first learned about it I, th I think in my case, it's also related to my early education. I, uh, I've i always liked geography maps. I, I'm fascinated even to today, like you know, looking into maps and what they're telling us, telling the story behind it. Uh, early on in my undergrad, I, I did a study abroad program in the Netherlands, and I was lucky enough to be one of the best departments of uh, GIS and remote sensing in the world. And I took all of their classes for free. So that was awesome. And that really hooked me. Uh, so I did a master's in agriculture, environmental science, but I didn't take any classes in agronomy. All of my classes were in geography. And then that's how I actually started find, finding, like was looking for a PhD. That's how I found the, the center online. And that's what led me to the position that I'm in today, which I'm basically making maps of the entire world every day. Uh, I'm on the, the it's called uh, base maps teams. So, for instance, today I was working on a map for the entire Brazil that the country is using to monitor the deforestation in the Amazon. Uh, so I got really used to looking into maps, and I don't see a, a future in my career where I will not be looking at it in terms of where are things, what's the story behind it, what's happening geospatially. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty much how I got into it. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool l l looking into maps every day now. All right, well, thank you all for those um, great answers. Uh, so 
now we're just open it up for uh, Q and A, both here in the room and online. We're online. Just use the raise your hand feature um, if you'd like to ask a question, and we'll we'll call on you. Um, but I see a hand up already in the back. Uh, well, yeah, actually, it was just kind of inspired by what Vinny was saying, which was very interesting. Um, it would be interesting to hear what a what a day in the life of is like. Can you can you say like what a typical work day is? What you're doing. Okay, start. Uh, mine, I, I try to start. So I'm a software engineer, so I'm good enough software. So I try to start with the hardest tasks that I have. Like it's a, sometimes I have to come up with a new algorithm. Sometimes I have to fix a bug. And I again, I don't have a, com a background in computer science. I in the beginning was really hard. Now I'm much better at that, finding what are the problems and. Uh, it took a lot of study. It still is a lot of study. So I start my day studying, seeing what's the problem, open the terminal, seeing what's going on there, checking my, my 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 previous job. So if I'm submitting things to the cloud and need to make sure that things are not running and costing the company thousands and thousands of dollars, I would start studying, checking what what's up, and then I would check emails and the other things. Uh, but yeah, my day is mostly looking at the map and looking at the script that made the map. So <laughs> what's the terminal telling me? What's the result? And then, and yeah, I, I'm very lucky again. I get to work with a lot of different things. So it's the first station in Brazil. It's the critical situation that we have uh, the wars uh, that's going on right now. Uh, it's looking at coral reef maps. So it's very diverse. I look at different problems. Uh, within the same day. So that, that's very cool. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, it's pretty diverse. So I just got, I was in Virginia um, doing stormwater control measure inspections. Um, that's not really JS related, but I do get to be in the field. Um, we have work at Nellis Air Force Base in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, which has been really cool. We're doing a water sustainability study there. And um, I mean, Nevada, West, drought, bad water, not available. Um, and so like, you know, doing water quality analysis of the groundwater wells, where can other wells go? What does that look like? And a lot of like regulatory review because in Nevada, there's something called water rights. Um, and so, that's been really fun. Again, not JS related. Uh, another element that I do a lot is integrate uh, engineered like CAD drawings into GIS. So we have all of our clients have such issues with data gaps and what's in the ground actually in terms of their utilities is never <laughs> reflective what's in GIS. And so a lot of the times we're, we're hired to help them really improve that. Um, and so a lot of our clients also use JS a lot. I mean, it's, it's a database and, and they need help managing it. And so it's um, doing like big batch attribution, making sure, you know, I mean, like database management, really um, QAQC of, of those kind of things um, are a few examples. Yeah, my work breaks down uh, essentially into three to four components. One is data management. Uh, we have our own database where we track uh, our proprietary data uh, on the market with within uh, real estate. Now there's, with that, there's third party resources for that, but uh, don't let fool you as it's garbage data. Uh, and we all know what garbage data produces, <clears throat> garbage results. So uh, we have to collect and uh, clean our own data and that that takes a lot uh, and that's where a lot of our value is derived from is having quality data. So data management and then producing uh insights from that so it's not really spatial related particularly uh even though there can be a spatial component to it using spatial analysis and all kinds of stuff to um, derive some type of insight from from the data that we're collecting and um and analyzing, um, but uh, using traditional analytical methods too. So um, data management analysis, writing insights, writing reports, um, and uh, then it's working, the, the thing that I enjoy the most is working directly with clients. 
whenever they come and bring in and say this, but the problem solver guy, it's, hey, here's this question that we have. Um, you're the research guy, you're supposed to be smart. Uh, what do we do? And you're just given this amorphous response and said, do something with this. And uh, you get to break it down. And it's not like a formal research process. Uh, you, you don't have enough time to do that. It's a corporate environment, right? You got to move fast. But uh, you use the same principles that you learn to, uh, to move quickly, but also wow them with the skills that you've learned. Uh, and that's where I really get to apply my GIS uh, and geospatial skills. Uh, to apply that to those bespoke requests and questions that they ask. Um, they don't get that type of skill or treatment uh, in other places. Uh, that's just not something that has been applied to the industry as much uh, yet. People are starting to catch on, uh, especially whenever they see people like JLL doing that now. Um, they see that these skills have uh, uses in a business environment to help business leaders make uh, fast, critical decisions. But um, no, it, they don't know that they need it until they see it. And so we get to show them the power of these skills. So. Can I comment? Sure. Yeah. Um, I will say, like, translation um, is something, is like a big thing. Talking to people who don't know anything about GIS, you know, from like all different types of backgrounds and them saying what they need to see, what they need to have happen, and then translating their stuff into like a GIS workflow or process or deliverable is a thing that comes up all the time. So I just mm -hmm. Peter, I think you had your, raise your hand. Yeah. I was going to comment on the day-to-day -day workflow question. I mean, for me, so I engineer solutions, which is exactly what my title is, as a solution engineer. Specifically, I work for state and local government. So I work with accounts and customers throughout the entire Southeast region, ranging from state government to county government, all the way down to city government. Um, exactly what was said before is my entire role is communicating the value of GIS to folks that don't understand it. So, and any day, I mean, last week I worked with a police department one afternoon, the tax assessor the next afternoon, then I switched over to economic bit or economic development and a couple other folks to help them realize how they can put their data on a map. It's like Brett mentioned, they have Excel files, which sounds very weird to us as GIS centric folks, but to them, that's how they've done things forever. So I go visit them as a technical resource Kind of help them explore the art of the possible a little bit and usually help that give some demonstrations from day to day on how our technology can impact them and usually in a positive way in other situations it might be telling them they need to migrate from ArcMap to arc pro which is a, a completely separate topic and a little bit more touchy but uh, exactly what else said too communicating the value is incredibly important but that is what i do in a nutshell Ella, did you want to respond? Yeah, I can add mine. Um, yeah, so I'm a federal employee, so I'm maybe like one of those customers of Peter's, actually. But I feel like a lot of what I do is the same thing Peter's doing, but from the inside, where I'm, I'm working with people that <clears throat> are managing programs. Uh, so plant protection and quarantine, we try to prevent the entry of um, exotic pests through imported goods. And then if they do get here, then we try to limit their spread. So we have different people managing programs at all different levels, different scales. Um, and they're kind of big and complicated and messy. So a lot of my day, day-to-day -day work is meeting with them to try to understand their jobs and how everything works together and where the where the swim swim lanes are, you know, who's supposed to be doing what. Um, there's a decent amount of, um, I don't even know if I want to call it bureaucracy. It's just a big complicated agency, you know, so there's just a lot of work that goes into understanding people's roles and how we all are supposed to work together. Um, and then once you have the sense of that, then my job becomes like 
trying to suggest ways to make their jobs easier through mostly through analytics, but also geospatial stuff if possible. Um, so for example, people are getting emailed PDFs then, and, and it's like 20 PDFs a day and they can't keep, keep on top of extracting that data and putting it into a form that they can use. My job would be to help them set up a workflow that would automatically extract that data, put it into a spreadsheet, and then put it into a dashboard on a map, hopefully, that, that would make their, their job a lot easier. And so they can focus in on the, the real need of what they're trying to do, the program management piece. Um, so I, I would say a lot, a lot of it is just working with working, working with folks to understand the pain points and uh, figuring out the right people to ask the right questions to. But then, you know, the fun part is I, I do get to do quite a lot of coding too. Um, so I try to uh, spend as much, that's the fun part for me. So I try to incorporate that in my day-to-day -day work as much as possible. Thanks. Yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Deja. I'm a third year and I'm going to start seriously looking for jobs soon. So my question is, I hope that each of you all can elaborate a little bit on what the application and interview process was like for each of your roles. Uh, I can start. Uh, mine was quite grueling. <laughs> I did eight interviews in total. Yeah, too like very technical. Was it really needed? No. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's it, and it's also. But besides all of the interviews, I think the most important part, and I think that goes that goes for 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 multiple companies, is to get to know someone inside. Like for a random position, like I. I that plan and then the other companies to you, like you have 2,000, 3,000 applicants. And I just saw that in one of the positions that we had opened, it was like 4,000 applicants. So there's no way to filter that out. If you know someone that knows someone, it helps a lot. So the HR will have a first filter, will go talk with you straight. Like that's, I think that's the first step. And then the other interviews, it's, a, and then, it, it depends. It depends on the position. It depends on who is the hiring manager as well. Uh, and and I think what are the expectations that they have from from the candidates? Like the so same position. I know like there is a, a friend of mine. He's in a similar software position, uh, software development position, and uh, he didn't do any coding to it because uh, he he had I don't know. I think his hire manager thought it wasn't necessary, so he didn't do anything. But, but yeah, I, I had to do a live Python interview, and that's like if it can be really stressful. Like it's uh, <laughs> it's uh, I I've never been so nervous in all my life. <laughs> like you have twenty minutes to figure this out, and then you have you have your your screen open, and then you, you code there. So it's either you know or you don't. And uh, I I knew so I. Was a good <laughs> thing. <laughs> but yeah, but it really depends. Asia. I help a lot with the uh, intern program at JLL. Uh, one of the things that I am big on is for them to have something very tangible for them to leave with that's, that they can speak to in an interview or that they can use as a carrot to get an interview. Um, so I would suggest having that, um, maybe even a portfolio, if you have it, uh, I'm not saying go out and do a bunch of work, but you've been doing work in your classes. Uh, if you've had an internship, hopefully you've been doing stuff other than getting coffee for them. If you've only been getting coffee, then that was a terrible internship. And I'm very sorry. Uh, they didn't do, do you, do you right. But, um, the best interview that you can have is to not just sit there and answer your questions, but bring something there. You open it up and they start asking you questions about what you did and you can flip through. You start talking about the projects that you did that shows a competency, uh, a, a skill competency 
that other people are not going to have. They're just going to come in, they're going to sit down and answer the, the standard questions and then cross their fingers and hope that they get a call back. That's taking ownership of the process. Um, you know, if they don't call you back, I mean, you laid it out all on the line by uh, by taking ownership of, of the situation. So that that's what I would encourage you to do. Uh, I mean, you asked about the interview and the hiring process, and I think, I mean, mine was at a really specific time, and it was, I mean, it was, I mean, it was regular. I applied for the job, I got a call, but it moved very fast because they needed somebody on site. It, well, it was Fort Bragg, but it's Fort Liberty now to serve as their data steward. Um, and so that was, I mean, it was, I think it was quicker and probably a lot less grueling than what it is to be on the job market right now. I I stay applying for jobs that look really good to me. I'm, I'm relatively happy in the job I have, but like keeping the interview skills really sharp and seeing what skills of mine are marketable and what they want to pay me to do that is something I still do and I like highly recommend. My manager would be mad at me, but that's okay. Um, also, I think and it's really annoying, but companies are, and the reason why I haven't taken a different job is because there's a lot less flexibility. Um, you know, I, I do get to travel, sometimes cool places, sometimes not. Some people like that, some people don't. Um, but like, I don't have to be in the office any number of day. Like, I don't need to. Everything I do is on a computer, GIS or not, everything is on the computer. My manager's not being silly about that. But there are companies that are, I mean, yeah, these like big companies and make, being like three to five, three three days in the office. There's no there's no business. There's no reason we need to do that, um, and that's a big reason why I haven't thought anything else. But here, Kellen. No. Kellen, do you want to go first, or do you want me to go? Go for it. Okay. Um, the Esri interview process, at least for my role, since. My primary job is giving demonstrations and presentations to articulate the value of GIS took in total time-wise about a week. So the initial interview was meeting with our team lead to discuss what the role was about. And they essentially do a very informal tech check on you. They ask you a couple questions just to see if you're the right fit personality-wise for the team, but also from a technical perspective, they'll ask you about your expertise. So um, I can tell you guys that they, they do like NC State alum a lot, uh, especially from the MGIST program. So take that as you will. The second step of the interview was more intense. Uh, it, was, it was actually the technical interview where you give a technical presentation. And that was done virtually for me since I was hired in, I think it was, yeah, July of 2021. So I did that virtually. That took about two and a half hours. And it was a formal presentation on something GIS related. For me, it was migrating data from the local government information model to web GIS or enterprise GIS. And they asked me a series of questions that at the time were challenging. And now that I'm in the role that I'm in, I understand why they asked, which is, why are you doing this? Why are you, because I used to work for an engineering firm. Why did the consultant perform this work? What was the end goal? Really getting behind the needs of the project. Uh, if you did this now, it would still be the same format. You'd have an HR interview, you'd have a solution engineer interview with your tip, your team lead, and then you would have an on-site eight-hour interview where you kind of go around the office meeting different people and they interview you in that space. And then you come back and you'll meet with our director of global business development is the last step. Um, so that's what the interview process looked like for me. I did a lot of it virtual since I was hired kind of on the downslope of COVID but now it's it's a lot more in-person based out of the Charlotte or the Atlanta area for our region. I think the only thing I would add, and this is really echoing what Vinny said, that I, I had some interviews with, that were super, super technical um, and they didn't pan out for me. And then the job that I ended up getting was the job that I had the most contacts with where they already kind of knew me and I had a ton of um, <clears throat> relevant experiences to to talk about in my interview. Um, so I feel like, you know, just having some connections with the place you're trying to get a job at, you know, however you, I know that you could even just kind of reach out, cold call people to 
get an understanding of the what the, the organization is like. Just have some sort of insider information could really help increase your chances. Um, because the the yeah the, the technical interviews um I did I thought I did well but yeah it, it was kind of it very competitive so ha having a some network there can really help your chances. All right so I'm gonna I'm gonna pull one question I get yours um that I think is related to this from a someone that submitted a question prior to the today, but, but I think it's a good one, particularly because I know we have a lot of uh, PhD students um, here and, and listening. So, uh, but, so this may start with Benny and, and Kellen, but um, so uh, what factors drove you to pursue careers outside of academia? Yes. <laughs> um, I really enjoyed my time here at the PhD. Uh, but I mean, as a grad student, do, I mean, the biggest downside is you don't get to, you don't, don't get paid as much. Like it's really hard and it's a nonstop work. Like you finish something, you have to start another one. It, it's nonstop. It only grows the piles. That's my feeling. That's how I left. I mean, and, but then again, I'm very privileged that I still do research. I still working on some really uh, cool things. Um, it's pretty much what I was doing here in, in the lab with Mirella and other students. I'm, I'm doing at a company now and being paid much more, which is, like, <laughs> which is what we want it's, uh, it's, I have a, a tremendous flip, 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 flip flexibility. Uh, for instance, I've, uh, I went to the gym, got back home, worked for three hours before I run, got back home, walked the dog, and then came here. And then I'll go back, work for another three hours, and this is how it works. So that, for me, that that's what really took me away. And I've kind of experimented that I'm doing an internship. So I did my internship during the PhD, uh, and that really helped. I said, well, if I can do this, I'll I'll try. But uh, but yeah. So I think it's a matter of finding a good position and what 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 you like and uh, what what you're comfortable with as well. But uh, yeah, I think that's what took me away from from academia. Um, yeah, I think I like the pace of, uh, I actually thought I wanted to work for industry. So I, I like the pace and having some real um, tangible applications to work on, th you know, things that have a, a real timeline. With academia, you know, it's really cool because you get to dive into super interesting topics as deep as you want to. Um, but it does require a lot of um, initiative on your own. Um, and I think I enjoy working working on a team with some some clear you know, forces driving me. So I was never really interested in, in academia actually, even from the beginning. So that's one of the reasons this PhD program was so attractive is it seemed like they were very supportive of people going in many, whatever direction, many different directions, including not academia. Yeah, your question. So, so my question is, was there any challenges going from like school to industry and not necessarily the work per se, but like changes in like how you got to like manage time or like how just changes how and how you have to like operate? I mean, yeah, so like, you know, the flexibility is really good. I mean, I can get really, I mean, and it depends so much on your manager. That's something that's so hard to suss out in the interview process is what the culture is like. Because like, you can ask all the questions you want to ask, but they're not going to give you the answer that you really want to know. It's, you know, how down the, how, like, how much over your shoulder they are really. Um, but like, you know, I can get to my computer whatever time I want to, but the first year I had to take an on-site job. I woke up at 4 a.m. every day to drive 90 minutes to work a 10 hour day. Um, I mean, that, like I said, I didn't have a choice, but like, you know, working nine to five, yeah, I mean, that's what you're, I mean, your Monday to Friday, you know, have to like kind of revolve around that. And I don't love it, um, but that's kind of the game that we're playing. Uh, I am autistic, and so communication is a thing that comes up for me a lot in my 
yeah and just like how i like navigate and like court it's very corporate and so like there's all these phrases there's all of these acronyms particularly like in the federal i mean there are so freaking many and i'm still like learning but that was the biggest thing i mean there's so many and for me particularly i'm like bottom up i have to do bottom up and so i have to know all the definitions of all the things before i can like zoom out and see like the big thing and so that's that's the thing that comes up a lot and knowing what people say because like really in corporate lingo and then i could talk about this forever People will say, they'll say a sentence, really, but that's not really what they mean. They really mean something else. And that's something that comes up. I mean, for me, a lot is like, and you also, when you want to say something, you have to translate it into the acceptable way to say something. Um, there's so many TikToks about that. It's helpful. But yeah, and, that, and honestly, like, that's an exhausting part of, like, existing in, I think, like, the corporate space. And, you know, hopefully, like, you know, you end up at a job that takes that burden off of you as much as possible. But speaking the language and adapting, you know, how we work. Yeah, that's what I'm coming on that. I have a, another thought that um, one thing that was tough for me to transition from academia was um, not being able to just work on the thing that you think is the coolest and most useful thing, uh, having to actually find out what what will have legs, you know, to work on. So I spent, I think a lot of time, my first six months or so, pitching a lot of ideas that just, I got crickets from. Um, so I, I had to spend a lot of time just figuring out what is actually needed. Um, and then working on that instead of vice versa, <laughs> the other way around. Because in academia, it's, in school, you get to really focus on whatever you think is cool, which is nice. Yeah. I think um, one last thing, or one thing that I think I would add is you have to shift your mindset a little bit, or at least I did, from uh, thinking about life day to day. Like I would point out, here's what I'm going to do today. And then the next day. Thinking about each day as a win, life became more like week to week or month to month because of that kind of that kind of thing, um, where you might not get a win today because there are just so many competing priorities on you and you might not get to work on or do the thing that you necessarily want to do that day. Um, but if you think about, uh, I'm gonna win this week um, and set priorities based on that, that helped me at least. Um, because it was easy for me if I was going day by day and I had I didn't win the day that day. Um, I felt like a failure, right? Um, there's, you, there's just so many competing priorities professionally whenever you get there because you're, you're there for so long. Um, so it feels like so long whenever you're first uh, getting into a kind of job um, that it can, uh, it can get so you feel like that. Um, so that's advice from your resident uncle, I guess. But, but not, <laughs> ask for help though, like task prioritization for me because I work, I can work on up to like my time sheet, I mean, might have 15 projects on it. And I, I did absolutely have to get support the first bit to be like, what is what is super important and how do you like navigate? Ask for support. All right, so I know we have some questions online. I want to make sure we get to them. Yeah, Khalil was first. All right, Khalil, do you want to ask your question? Yes, hello, panel. Thank you all for um, your insight and things. So I am I am currently working with the DOT um, in, a, in a division, and so not in the DIT with the GIS unit. So what kind of advice would you give for organizations that have individual GIS practitioners that don't have a like a concrete role in what they're doing. So it's like a new org or or an org that recognizes they need GIS, but they don't exactly know what it does all the way. And so yeah, you as a kind of as a practitioner is kind of just in the dark on in a sense on what you can do or what things to be able to do because there's so much variation of what can be done, if that makes sense. So you're like responsible for building their GIS program from the ground up, is that what you're saying? 
Not fully. I'm in charge of, um, I guess, creating different products for different assets. So I work with, um, I'm currently working with my maintenance engineer and we've created a sign survey, but then there's also a need for a, like a guardrail survey and all these other kinds of things. And so it, it comes by request sometimes, but then there's also like needs for database type of things as well. So a lot of it is kind of, it's, it's kind of fluid. It doesn't really have a concrete, yeah, structure to it. Yeah, I guess, I guess maybe a way to kind of, mm -hmm. and you can tell me if I'm wrong, but kind of rephrase what he's asking is, um, do you have advice for um, maybe folks in Khalil's position that work for organizations that are just finding out the value of GIS um, how he can navigate that situation, but also would you have advice for how that organization can better uh, integrate GIS into their work? Perfect, yeah, thank you. Yeah. I mean, it really depends. Um, I mean, how much like money and resources does that entity want to, you know, dedicate to building out or doing and adding all the things. Um, and that's, that's a hard position to be in. I think my, my advice is get a quick win up front, get them on the hook, build trust, um, and then make a recommendation, like specific recommendations about what you think needs to happen and set yourself up as the subject matter expert. And this one will um, build confidence in you as the person that's gonna be doing this. And if you're by yourself, um, you're, I mean, you're, you're the subject matter expert on it, right? So uh, you've got to own it um, and you got to know what, what you're talking about, what you're doing. So get them on the hook, make sure that they know that you're a subject matter expert and then take it one bite at a time, uh, but make sure that they see the wins continually. Uh, Cause I think that a pitfall that we can fall into is that we see what the end result can be and the infrastructure that needs to happen uh, and we automatically go to that. We're like, here's everything that we need. And this is how much it's going to cost. And here's, and they don't get it. And they think that it costs a bunch of money and it does cost. Money. Uh, and they're like, that just, that seems like a lot. And really all we need is this. But you see everything on the back end that it takes to get, build it one step at a time and keep them coming back for more. And, uh, and you'll get there. Uh, I think you'll get there, but I think you've get you got to take the bull by the horn uh, and make sure that that you run that you run the show um, and that they that they trust you. All right, let's do one more more question from Sky. Sky, mm -hmm. yeah, Sky, you want to ask your question? Yeah. So this was kind of sort of answered earlier, but just given the specialized nature of GIS within computer science. What advice do you uh could you offer on like finding the right job fit in this field? I mean, like when you're doing uh interviews, like you're you're also kind of sort of interviewing them to see if you want to be there and get on their team and their board. And so especially too, right out of your academic program, um, just how did you kind of decide? what what wherever you did end up like why you wanted to end up there and then if you're still there um the possessing the gis skills that you do have do you think that has influenced your decision to remain in that same position or the same company all right so let's let's have Vinny and peter answer that one um so peter you want to go first <laughs> yeah i can uh so Sky, your question is twofold. The first is kind of how we, or at least I, decided to get where I was. When I first came out of college for undergrad, it was less about um, the company. It was less about the technology that they were using. It was 
choosing my first manager. And there's some study somewhere I, I could send it to you if I had some time that shows the progression that your first manager has on your career. And it talks about that person giving you opportunity and exposure to learn what new things. And like within Esri, I'm on a team that is a public works subject matter expert. So I work a lot with public works departments. How I got there, my previous job exposed me a lot to public works. How did I get there? My first job put me on every public works project we had. That's just where I started. So it's, I'm evidence of that. Um, what keeps me here is, is more the ability to kind of learn technology very, very fast. So my job is to know a lot about, or sorry, a little about a lot. So the, the second portion of your question that keeps me here, that's why I transitioned to Esri is that I like the management I have here. I enjoy the people that support me and I can learn and continue to grow more in my field instead of just staying potentially pigeonholed in one area or another. When I first got my job out of my undergrad at Collier's Engineering and Design, I actually had two offers on the table, one for an electrical uh, pike engineering group and then another one with Collier's Engineering. And I looked at it and said, an engineering firm is more broad. I can learn more there. So those are kind of the decisions that led me to, to choosing the career path that I did and then transitioning. Thanks, Peter. Oh, yes. Uh, in my case, I've, I first narrowed down to, I, I was looking like, what, what are the companies? For my case, it was really specific. Like they are dealing with uh, set, 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 set satellite image data, they're processing a large scale. What are the companies? What are they doing? What are their mission? And uh, this is really what I looked into it. And when I was doing the interview, I also interviewed them. I think that's a great point. You have to make them hard questions as well, and uh, and and then go back to to what what, what Peter mentioned. Uh, management is super super important. I I'm super lucky that my manager is great. Uh, he's a superstar in the field. Uh, he does give me the opportunities to to work on my own projects. And to keep improving, uh, to keep learning, I think that's for sure what really keep, 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 keeps me at, at my job. And uh, yeah, so I, I think you, you can narrow down the what are the, the positions. Uh, it's all about timing as well. Sometimes the companies they they are not hiring, so we have to to be aware of what are, what's open, what are the positions, what are the companies look 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 for like. Like what's 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 they offering? What what they are asking for? And uh, and then yes, if if you have an insight on the management, that's great because uh, it really does make a ton of difference. Uh, I, I, I I always joke joke about this, but if my manager moves, I'll ask him to take me with him. <laughs> just so way way too great. So yes, I think this is just a compliment to to what Peter said. Great. All right. So we're, we're running to time. So I'm going to have two sort of rapid fire questions for each panelist. Um, and we'll kind of finish out our, our time here. All right. So the first question is, um, which specific skill from NC State uh, do you think helped you obtain your current role? And we'll start with any. Uh, the ability to solve problems, 100%. Uh, this is what I do every day. And during my PhD, that's what I was doing. This is what you guys do too. Uh, it's you know ability to see a problem and just go after it and don't stop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, the ability to tell stories through data visualization. Good googling. Helen. Cody. Here. Uh, presentation and demonstration skill set. So the ability to communicate the value. All right, so somewhat of a related um, question. Uh, so what skill maybe that you did not pick up at NC State did you pursue after the fact that proved to be most valuable? Being able to talk with uh, people that's outside my, my expertise. Um, I had to learn the real estate market from the ground up. Uh, because my boss and my teammate quit within six weeks of me getting my job. I was supposed to just be the GIS guy. And then, uh, then I began more than that. So. Mm, cutting. Uh, Kellen? Um, how to 
lead up how to influence my manager when you have bad management. It's the opposite of Benny and Peter. <laughs> Mine would be the sales cycle. Uh, it was something I was unfamiliar with. I did a little bit of business development in my first job, but now in this role, Esri puts you through a pretty intensive uh, learning process for that. All right. Well, uh, I think that's a good place to stop. We're just a couple minutes over four. Uh, so please run a call for all of our panel. Helen and Peter, thank you for, for joining remotely. And uh, yeah, I'm sure we'll be done. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.